So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Davide. I'm one of the Urology R1s. I'd like to start by thanking the department for allowing me to give this talk. Uh, specifically, I'd like to thank Dr. Chris Guan, who's the faculty point person for the subject. I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. James Lang, who's one of our colleagues in transplant nephrology and a field expert who consulted on my talk. So the topic I'm going to talk about today is HLA in transplant, specifically for renal transplant. Now, um, I won't be talking a whole lot about surgery, but I still think this is a very important topic in this forum. Not only because here at UBC, we've built a very impressive transplant program that's really become a cornerstone of the urology training program, but also because, and this is something I've discovered while doing research for this talk, a lot of the advancements in this field, both in terms of the science as well as the clinical practice, has been brought by surgeons. And as such, I think it's germane for us to understand it a little better. So without further ado, I'll start with a bit of a case study that got me interested in the topic. I'll talk a little bit about the biology of HLA enough to inform the rest of our conversation. I'll give a brief history to highlight some of the contributions that uh, surgeons have made to the field, talk about HLA matching and outcomes, um, and why it's important to match HLA. And I'll also talk about why people get sensitized and how this affects outcomes and how we can counteract that. And last, I'll talk a little bit about uh, transplant tolerance, which is a very interesting future direction of the field. So we'll start with the case study. So this is a 38-year-old gentleman who has end-stage renal disease, secondary to biopsy-proven diabetic nephropathy. He's pre-dialysis. He has normal urine output. He has insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, complicated by neuropathy and retinopathy in addition to his nephropathy. And he has hypertension. So, you know, a relatively healthy um, pre-dialysis patient. A living-related transplant from his brother is proposed. Both are blood type O positive. Both are CMV negative. So HLA typing is done. And I'll summarize this by saying that they're HLA identical. So with this in mind, they go ahead with the transplant. Now this is a, kind of a bit of a summary of standard immunosuppression. And um, I'm not going to go through it item by item. But depending on immunologic risk, Patients typically must undergo induction with either basiliximab, which is um, a uh, chimeric mouse human monoclonal antibody against uh, the alpha chain of the IL-2 receptor, if they're low immunologic risk. And if they're high immunologic risk, they get rabbit antithymoglobulin, which is basically just a mixed bag of antibodies against T cell epitopes, which knocks out T cells. Um, HLA identical donor recipient pairs can forgo this induction phase this kind of nuclear attack on the uh, immune system, and really just receive steroids, um, mycophenol and mofetil, which is a purine analog, and tacrolimus, which is a calcineurin inhibitor. So the, the transplant happens. Cold ischemic time and anastomotic time is above. No, bas no basiliximab or ATG were used. Graft function was immediate, and patient was discharged home post-op day four with a creatinine of 98 on MMF and tacrolimus. And the hope is that over the long term, maybe immunosuppression can be spared, can be slightly spared, or can be reduced for this gentleman, um, given that he's got HLA identical kidney. So, with that in mind, let's start talking a little bit about what HLA is and what the biology means. So, HLA is a group of proteins that are encoded by the major hist um, human major histocompatibility complex, and these are located on chromosome six. They're expressed um, on the surface of cells and play a crucial role in the immune response against foreign pathogens as well as tumor immunity. Um, these are some of the most variable loci in the mammalian genome. And the reason they're so variable is because of the variety of pathogens that are out there that are trying to attack our system and that we need to be able to present these to the immune system. This variability, however, presents a challenge to transplant. And there are two major classes of HLA, and I'm going to take you down a bit of a trip down memory lane to undergraduate immunology, but there's MHC class 1, which is expressed on most nucleated cells. It, presents, it typically presents intracellular peptides, about nine amino acids in length, and they typically present to CDA positive killer T cells. Um, and they're composed of two proteins. Here is the major, this is the MHC class 1 protein, which is attached to a beta-2 microglobulin to make up its quaternary structure. There are three major types of HLA, class 1, that we think about in transplant, HLA A, B, and C. 
And they're all, each of them are individual genes. Each person has two copies of this gene, as you would expect. MHC class 2 is express, are expressed exclusively on antigen-presenting cells. Well, pretty much exclusively. And they present extracellular antigens. They're generally present on, they generally present to CD4 positive helper T cells. And these, their quaternary structure is actually made up of two HLA molecules, an HLA alpha chain and a beta chain, as you can see here um, in the diagram. There are three major types of HLA class two that we think about in transplant, HLA DP, DQ, and DR. Each of these with their own corresponding alpha and beta chain, with the exception of HLA DR, in which there are four identified beta chains, each human having about three, ha having only three um, in their in their genetic complement. So, before we um, talk about diversity at the various HLA loci, it's briefly worth touching on how they're named for clarity. So, if we look at a HLA matching um, uh, diagram like the one I showed earlier, you see HLA, which means human leukocyte antigen. You see the gene. So HLA B is the gene. And then there are variants, so star, number. The number means allele group. Each allele group can present slightly different proteins, and so the following number designates a different protein. And, and these are kind of, this is kind of, this part that's boxed off in red is the part, oop, is the part that we're interested in. Then there are synonymous mutations in exons, so mutations in coding regions of the gene that don't really make a difference. And then there's synonymous mutations in introns, um, which are in non-coding parts, which don't make a difference to the protein structure in the end. So keeping that in mind, there are a vast number of HLA alleles out there. So in terms of class A, class 1, there are over 5,000 HLA, HLA A alleles, over 6,000 HLA B alleles, and just under 5,000 HLA-C alleles. With M HLA class 2, this is compounded by the fact that you can mix and match alpha and beta chains. So there are a vastly increased number of possibilities for HLA DR, DQ, and DP. Now you might think, with this incredible diversity, how the heck are we supposed to match people? Well, the reality is a lot of these alleles are extremely rare. The variants, like over 40% of them, are classified as extremely rare, which means that they're identified in three or fewer individuals, and these individuals can even be consanguineous. So, and there are some HLA alleles that are identified in one person. <coughs> and this is, there's like this ongoing project to just type patients with, um, to try to find new HLAs. Are these, any of these linked to these rare uh, alleles linked to the autoimmune disorders? Yeah, so that's a really good question, and it's, um, I'll, I'll touch a little bit on other applications of HLA diversity at the end, but truly there are, unfortunately because they're so rare, it's very difficult to draw a causal relationship between alleles for which there's one variant, like one allele in the world, and disease. Now there are certain HLA variants that are rare, but are present at a high enough level that they can be identified as a rare risk uh, factor for certain um, autoimmune disorders like you know rheumatoid arthritis for example um, uh, but um, these extremely rare ones I think are, are, are a bit difficult more difficult to draw a causal relationship um, this diversity that we talked about here is compounded by the fact that you inherit one of each of these HLA from each parent and that they're codominantly expressed so on the surface of cells you can have a really impressive variability, which, which really contributes to uh, the diversity of peptides that can be presented. Now the reason we care about HLA is because HLA are immunogenic. Common settings in which HLA-specific antibodies are produced are pregnancy, blood transfusions, and of course transplant. Patients who express anti-HLA antibodies are termed sensitized and have reduced transplant options, and we're going to talk a little bit about this later. Non-sensitized patients are also always at risk of developing de novo donor-specific antibodies. Um, and this is proportional to the number of donor antigens that are mismatched when we transplant them. And this is something we have to keep in mind, and we'll talk about a little more later. So before we run into the, before we jump into the substantive part of the talk, I want to talk a little bit about the history of HLA and the history of transplant. Because this is very interesting, and it's, it's a very, very, 
um, frenzied pace of discovery in the last century. Starting from the first MHC, which was identified in mice in 1936, and then before we even identified HLA in humans, Joseph Murray at Brigham and Women's Hospital performed the first kidney transplant in identical twins. Shortly thereafter, in 1958, Dosset identified HLA A2, which is one of the most common HLA in, um, in uh, humans. And then after that, starting in the 60s all the way to the 80s, there's this like frenzied pace of discovery. First, Starzl identified the, or published the use of the first immunosuppressive regime with azathioprine and prednisone. Starzl is a surgeon, um, which allowed for achieving lasting renal allograft acceptance. And then we started identifying that maybe it wasn't antibodies against ABO blood types that caused rejection, and that there was some other antigen, and that was 1966. Then 1968, we identified that the human major histocompatibility complex gene was most likely responsible for these antibodies, that preformed cytotoxic antibodies shortly thereafter against the donor were a strong contraindication to transplant, and that HLA actually had similar epitopes um, and that matching them could improve graft survival. All of this within the space of a decade, 1960s to, 19, to early 1970s. 1980s brought some advances in immunosuppression with uh, cyclosporin A and tacrolimus. Again, stars were bringing these, um, uh, publishing these advancements. And then more recently, we've had some different types of innovation in transplant. So the first kidney pair donation program to improve accessibility of kidneys to sensitized donors. And then the idea that we can transplant across cross-match positive recipients, which means we can transplant sensitized individuals who don't have that many kidney options. In parallel to these, there's been a number of developments in HLA typing. And while I show this here at the bottom as kind of like a parallel process, we kind of still use them all together because they each tell us a different thing. So, the first type of HLA matching was complement-dependent cytotoxicity, which is you're putting donor or putting recip recipient serum on donor T cells and said, does it kill the cells? And if it does, that's bad. That's cross-match positive. We can't use that. Um, we can't use uh, that kidney. Then came along uh, flow cytometry, which is more sensitive, but less specific, or not more specific than CD uh, complement-dependent cytotoxicity. But the problem with both these assays is that every lab does them differently. And every lab has a different um, array of donor cells, of donor epitopes that can be tested against, a different panel that they test. So there's no way of, of standardizing them. So more recently, we've developed these solid phase assays where beads are coated with a wide variety of HLA. And the uh, donor serum is applied to it. And you can test directly against, um, you can test whether there's antibodies directly against specific class 1 and class 2 antigens. This is done in parallel with donor and recipient sequ HLA sequencing to tell us what HLA they have. And based on this, you can make uh, a virtual cross match. The caveat about this is that some donor alleles may not be present on this synthetic panel, these, this solid phase panel. And solid phase assays are extremely sensitive. And since you're not showing directly that there's antibodies in a donor that act on, act on cells in a recipient, um, it's unclear whether these low-level antibodies might have a biologic significance for transplant. And so oftentimes, they go back to complement-dependent cytotoxicity to see, well, are these true, are these relevant antibodies? Are these all sort of pre-approved assays that are standardized yeah. across the institution? Yeah, so this is the nice thing about the HLA-coded microbeads and, the, um, and sequencing. Mind you, sequencing is done by a couple of different methods. There's next-gen sequencing, which we're using more here, as, um, as well as uh, sequence-specific uh, uh, amplification. Um, but this virtual cross-match allows us to try to match a donor here with a recipient in Toronto, um, because we don't need both of them to be here. We don't need serum and cells from both patients. So what does HLA matching matter, then? Does it change outcomes for patients? And um, there's a number of uh, studies that try to, sh try to show this, that try to show that HLA matching does uh, affect outcomes. And this is a really nice study, I think, out of Johns Hopkins using the UNOS database, so that's the United, uh, United States Organ Sharing Database. It's a retrospective cohort study. Um, and they looked at the first, um, first deceased donor transplants between 1987 and 2013. 
So that's 189,141 transplants followed for 900 and over 994,000 transplant years. Um, and they typed these patients, or they, have data, they had data for these patients, genotype on HLA A, B, and DR loci. And on multivariate analysis, adjusting for both donor and recipient characteristics, as well as uh, transplant era, they showed that there is a linear relationship between HLA mismatches and graft loss. So the first locus, it conferred a risk of about 13%. And this all went all the way up to 64% if you had six lo loci mismatched. And this seems to be independent of the type of locus mismatch. And this is a bit, this is a bit of a change. Uh, this kind of changed the thinking in the field because it was thought before this that HLA-DR might be more immunogenic or more important to match than HLA-A and B. But there's obviously other HLAs that we talked about. And are these HLA relevant? So the next one I want to talk about is HLA-DQ, which is a class 2. Um, and um, this nice study out of Australia and New Zealand dialysis transplant registry, um, looking at living and deceased donors between 2004 and 2012, looking at 788 kidney transplant recipients with a median follow-up time of 2.8 years, showed um, that HLA-DQ mismatches are associated with an increased risk of um, transplant rejection, both antibody-mediated and T-cell-mediated. And you can see here in this uh, survival curve. Now, this was independent of HLA A, B, and DR matching, which we already know are important for graft survival, independent of sensitization status, and independent of initial immunosuppression use. Now, the one weakness of this study is it doesn't really show that it changes transplant outcomes. So, despite this increased risk of rejection, GFR five years later was fine, and um, actual graft survival was unchanged. So, Really, this shows that there's, if you mismatch, there's an increased rate of um, rejection, but it's all manageable rejection. The last HLA locus that's worth talking about is HLA-DP. Um, and um, this is a study out of uh, Heidelberg, Germany, using a, like an international worldwide HLA typing transplant database. And they looked at um, <coughs> transplants uh, they looked at uh, 3,659 first-time transplants, 1,122 second-time transplants, 167 third-time transplants, and 16 fourth-time transplants. There aren't too many fourth-time transplants out there. And what they showed is that while HLA-DP doesn't really matter for the first transplant, and you can see here in the first survival curve, mismatches at this locus don't seem to affect graft survival for the first cadaveric transplant. On subsequent transplants, matching at this locus matter with an 83% graft survival um, at one year in HLA-DP matched patients, down to 76 in one mismatch and down to 73 in two mismatches. And this is kind of in line with what, we th what, what the, the field knew about HLA-DP and that it was a classic kind of second set locus and that it causes stimulation of primed but not unprimed lymphocytes. Now, obviously, it's clear from all of this that HLA matching matters, that patients do better if we match them well. Um, that being, and we reduce the risk of sensitization, which I'm going to get to shortly. But it also, matching patients very carefully almost identically reduces their risk of a transplant, or reduces their likelihood of a transplant offer. And transplant allocation algorithms have to take this into account when selecting candidates. And that's something that we're going to talk about a little more later as well. So the next topic is HLA sensitization. So what happens when we make antibodies against HLA and how does that affect transplant? Now, as I said earlier, HLA sensitization can result from any exposure to HLA antigens and adversely affect the transplant matching outcomes. HLA molecules, and you know, we, sh we showed the diagram earlier, have several hypervariable reason regions in their membrane distal domain um, that um, kind of change the primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure of the proteins. And depending on what happens to the, to the tertiary and quaternary structure, different epitopes can be exposed and recognized as foreign. So variation in HLA sequence or amino acid composition doesn't always translate into a different electrostatic motif, so a different tertiary or quaternary structure. And that would explain serologic cross-reactivity between HLA, different HLA. But conversely, you can mismatch against one HLA 
develop antibodies and then be sensitized against a variety of HLA given um, that they might share epitopes with the mis um, that are mismatched. So, who gets sensitized and what sensitizing events matter? And this is a study out of Portugal where they looked at the presence of HLA class 1 and 2 antibodies in um, patients who had uh, sensitizing events. So they looked at 70, 722 kidney transplant candidates before they're transplanted. 453 of them had at least one sensitizing event, a transfusion, a pregnancy, or a prior transplant. Um, and compared to patients with zero sensitizing events, um, it would appear that transplant was obviously the worst insult with creating the most sensitization uh, for both HLA class 1 and class 2. Pregnancy actually is quite a bit lower, but it's the next one up. 38% um, of patients, 30, 38 or 39% of patients developing antibodies. And then transfusion, the risk is relatively low, somewhere between 10 and 20% of developing sensitization. These antibodies are also not permanent, and if you retest patients every three months, certain antibodies might fall off. However, there's also a little bit of evidence showing that um, inflammatory insults, so trauma, infection, can reawaken these antibodies, and antibodies that have previously disappeared can come back. So what, what does this mean? What does, what, how do we measure sensitization, and where, what, how does that affect how we allocate transplants and transplant outcomes. So now, based on the solid phase assays that we have with the gene, gene typing, um, we use what's called a calculated panel reactive antibody score. So it's this virtual cross match. Um, and it's used to calculate how relatively sensitized the patient is. And they look at what HLA these patients have antibodies to. And then they look at how frequently that HLA pops up in the population. And based on that, they can say, this is about the size of the donor pool we need. To make sure to you know um, to make sure that we can find a transplant for this patient for this recipient, so let's like like do a case study of highly sensitized individual. This is a patient with calculated panel reactive antibody of ninety nine point nine nine. You can't get much more sensitized than that. So if we wanted to create a if we wanted to generate a randomly generate a population of um, donor potential donors based on that level of sensitization. To get a 99% probability of a donor match would require a population of 46,000, which is vast. It's much bigger than any transplant population, uh, donor pools we have. But a patient who is just slightly less sensitized, 99.9, .9, so 0.09% less sensitized, requires a much smaller pool, 4,602, to get a 99% probability of finding a match. And this shows that small differences in calculated panel reactive antibody score can make large fluctuations in transplant eligibility. That being said, you know, these are highly sensitized individuals and those donor pools, even, even 4,602 is quite large as a donor pool. How is it possible that we can match these people? Well, lucky for us, the majority of people are not that sensitized. So, um, and you can see in the diagram here, most, pa most patients, so, so over 70%, are gonna be between zero and 20% sensitized. So and that's why transplant programs work. For the other patients, we need to start thinking about new things. And so we'll talk, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, oh, so, Dr. Patterson. So for James Lee, um, if the patient starts chemo, what's their probability of getting transplanted in the first year, or getting a transfusion in the first year? Because you always try to go and get these as a preemptive strike when you have a transplant. But if they do start chemo, yeah. What's your likelihood of getting a transfusion? So it depends. Um, we try very hard not to transfuse patients. Um, some patients present very late in the SRP, they're anemic, but then we try very hard to give them air gas to jab out the chemo when they don't have transfusion, especially if they have the patients. Unfortunately, some patients, right, on the two set, there are many scenarios. You know, they had a trauma, a QP, and all that dialysis, and they do think a lot. So that, you know, nothing can um, so I, I would say probably overall about 10 to 15 percent of patients with a blood transfusion uh, within the first year of hemodialysis. Uh, with the advent of air nest, um, I think those mitigated numbers it used to be much higher, but now that it's more manageable. Sometimes when patients are living donor transplant, I say in three months, and all of a sudden they need to get a blood transfusion, and by a better transplant coming up, 
what I've done before is to just put him on immune suppression and keep him with blood. And then I keep on immune suppression on the attack of surgery. Um, I just want to add to the CPRA story here. So in Canada, our highly sensitized patients are about 95% to 100%. And there's about 460 patients on the wait list out of 2,000. So 25% of our wait list patients are considered to be highly sensitized. And the majority are 99% or higher. And, and as you said, there's a difference between 99.0 to 99.9%. There's actually a very large uh, difference for these patients. 99.9 essentially .9 means you'll never get a transplant. 99.0% means that you still have a shot. And one of the ways that these patients became very highly sensitized is many of them have had allograft nephrectomy in the past. Before they got here to the and I think that's one area historically uh, we, we discussed with surgeons, you know, uh, how much donor tissue is left after one performs an allograft nephrectomy. And many surgeons will vouch that there's there's absolutely nothing left. But we, we're not sure. I think um, the fact of allograft nephrectomy itself is very immunizing on its own. And many patients, they develop antibodies. And perhaps for some patients, after the nephrectomy, there is some vascular tissue still left. And if you continue with joint immunosuppression, which is the standard of care for many centers, patients actually become very, very sensitized. And we've had patients with 0%, and then let's say they have a bad outcome throughout thrombosis. Their kidney comes out, they come up with immunosuppression. The next time we see them, they're 100% you now. Know, and, and that's happened uh, actually too many times now. So now that when someone gets out of the preference is that we put them on immunosuppression, and we don't take them off. They can probably take less, but don't completely come up. Okay. So, you know, obviously, I mean, it's clear that sensitization matters a lot. Um, and um, I'm going to talk about a couple of approaches now to sensitization and thinking about sensitization and, and giving kidneys to patients who are sensitized. <clears throat> now, obviously, approaching sensitization has been improved by our improved uh, cross matching technology. Um, and obviously, as I mentioned previously, the optimal cross-match has to be balanced with the uh, challenges of finding a potential donor, which can be a problem in patients who are a very rare HLA variants or patients who are already sensitized. And so if a perfectly HLA-matched donor is not available, what's the solution? Well, so, and, and the question is, and the question we can start, we can start addressing the question by looking at the relative immunogenicity of various HLA. And this is a study of Johns Hopkins, um, and they looked at um, 703 renal transplant patients with no donor-specific antibodies prior to transplant. And then they looked at the frequency of antibodies to mismatched HLA A, B, DR, and DQ antigens. And what they showed is that across all these antigens, only HLA B had a significantly lower level of um, development of donor-specific antibodies when mismatched. Um, but HLA-A, DR, and DQ seem to be equally immunogenic. But that being said, if you look at it under a, um, a microscope and you think a little longer about it, and this group tried to do this, and you stratify by individual type of HLA um, alleles, the response is actually highly variable, going from 15% to 76%. And the risk of developing donor-specific antibodies likely has something to do not only with the immunogenicity, the intrinsic immunogenicity of the HLA, but also the degree to which that epitope or that HLA carries epitopes that's shared with other HLA. And interestingly, this group um, also tried to answer that question to see if cross-reactive antigens were an effect modifier. And what they showed was that that's indeed the case. So for example, if you have a patient, a donor, who is a recipient that are mismatched at HLA A3 and A1, which have similar antigens, there was a 43.6% reduction in the development of donor-specific antibodies. But the converse is also true, right? So if you mismatch someone um, and they develop antibodies to HLA A1, the likelihood of developing antibodies to HLA A3 is also high. Another consideration is the frequency of the HLA allele in the population. So HLA A2 is one of the most common HLA, as I mentioned before, in the human population. About 50% of North Americans have this HLA A2. And it's highly immunogenic. 78% of patients in this study 
developed antibodies against HLA-A2 and they was mismatched. Cross-reactive antigen, uh, patients who had cross-reactive antigens, it was only reduced to 58%. So if you're going to mismatch someone, you'd probably want to avoid HLA-A2, not only because it sensitizes them, not only because it's very immunogenic, but also if they were to get subsequent transplants, they'd be sensitized against a, a wider number of donors. So can we leverage this to try to match people better? Um, and when matching people, or when mismatching people rather, rationally, or using uh, a, like a calculated approach to mismatching people, there's a couple things that we should probably keep in, in, in mind based on these studies. One, the in immunogenicity of the HLA in question, the presence of cross-reactive antigens between donors and recipients, and the frequency of the mismatched allele in the population. And if you look at the, um, <clears throat> this little diagram I have here, we have our donor, our recipient here, and donor 1 is mismatched between HLA A29 and A1. If their epitopes shared are similar, the likelihood of developing antibodies is lower, whereas HLA A32 and A2 maybe don't play as nice with A29. And as such, might be, even though they're all only mismatched at one locus, donor 1 would be a much better fit than donor 2 or 3. And so this is a bit of a theoretical consideration, but the Euro Eurotransplant group tried to address this hypothesis with, their, with a special program they have called the Acceptable Match Program, um, where they tried to leverage epitope similarity to match highly sensitized patients and repeat transplant patients. And as you would imagine, they, co they compared uh, the 1,000 patients enrolled in this arm versus standard kidney allocation system, which is called the Unacceptable Match, where HLA that are unacceptable exclude donors. And as you can see in the unacceptable match, HLA mismatching, as we showed previously, actually had worse graph, um, graph survival. But in these patients who are highly sensitized, who underwent this kind of more directed uh, epitope matching uh, donation program, uh, allocation program, HLA mismatches had a much, much smaller effect on graft outcomes. Not only did they have much smaller effect on gra graft outcomes, they decreased the wait time for highly sensitized patients. So that's kind of one way of thinking about it. And there's, there's obviously that particular field is vast, and there's a lot of applications to it, including decreasing immunosuppression for well-matched patients. But um, in the interest of time, um, we're going to move on um, and talk about patients who are highly sensitized for which there's really no way to circumnavigate uh, the match, uh, no way to circumnavigate their sensitization. And the only way to address these is to, to, to um, transplant across the antibody barrier. And there's a couple of, people have developed a couple of protocols for this. Um, the evidence in living donors is much more robust. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a regimen of both PLEX as well as low-dose IVIG. Um, and uh, this study, this very nice study out of Johns Hopkins, it's a retrospective uh, study of 22 centers between 1997 and 2001 looked at patients who were desensitized using this pro protocol um, or versus patients who were waitlisted and waited for DCD transplants versus patients who just stayed on dialysis. And as you can imagine on the survival uh, curve here on the left, um, the patients who were on dialysis did the worst because patients on dialysis do poorly. Then what's interesting here is that the patients who were desensitized using the protocol and received a living donor transplant did better over eight years than patients who just waited for a DCD kidney transplant. That was, that was an acceptable match for them. What and the, the IVIG. Um, no. IV, oh, yeah, sorry, it's, yeah. The type, typeface did something weird there. Um, so, and this association held regardless of how strong the donor-specific antibodies was. There is a protocol for deceased donors as well. It, the evidence is much less good. The case series are smaller. Um, so I'm going to kind of skip over this in the interest of time. But um, people are experimenting with different things in small phase one and phase two trials. There's also a number of future directions in this field based on novel therapies that are used in antibody-mediated rejection. Um, and there's some excellent basic science as well as phase one and phase two clinical trials looking at complement inhibitors, ecolutumab being the uh, prototype here, um, famously known for being one of the most expensive drugs in the world, an antibody against uh, um, C5A, IL-6 and IL-6 receptor blockers, which are already approved for use in psoriatic arthritis and other autoimmune diseases, 
And this other, this new kid on the block, which is an IgG degrading enzyme derived from S. pyogenes, um, which rapidly drops the level of IgG in the blood. Um, I'm, I'm, I have slides on this, but in the interest of time, there's a lot of like interesting science in the area. I'm gonna kind of move on to the next topic, and if there's any other questions at the end, I can I can look at those slides with you. The last thing I want to talk about is a future direction in the field that I think is very exciting. And this is not engineering organs. The expert on that is coming next week, so we're going to have a transplant jamboree. But um, I'm going to talk about transplant tolerance, which is an immune method of making someone accept their graft. And the idea of transplant tolerance is rooted in the fact that humans have mechanisms for inducing self-tolerance to antigens. This is a process by which T cells respond, your, um, identify your own antigens, but don't respond to them. And there's central mechanisms, which are positive and select, uh, negative selection in the thymus, as well as peripheral um, mechanisms using T regulatory cells. Similarly, transplant tolerance uses inducing immune tolerance, the allograft, um, while maintaining response to foreign antigens as a method of um, withdrawing immunosuppression. And the benefits of this would be that you'd be able to completely withdraw immunosuppression. And the side effects of immunosuppression aren't great. Cancer, infection, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, cardiovascular disease is not completely benign. And you'd be able to eliminate the risk of acute and chronic rejection completely, thereby eliminating the need for retransplant. And this is done by inducing what's called donor chimerism, which is to make, to have the patient either temporarily or permanently have elements of the immune system of both the donor and the recipient. The risk here is obviously of graft versus host disease, as with any bone marrow transplant. And so several groups have developed protocols to try to address this. The MGH group tried to do this and it tried to induce transient chimerism. So for a very brief period of time, the, do the recipient has both immune cells from the living and from the, um, from the donor as well as the, um, as the recipient. Um, and they used a non-complete myeloablative technique. So they didn't knock the bone marrow completely. And so for seven or so days, the recipient has elements of both immune systems. And the nice thing about this is because the, the chimerism is transient, you can do it in HLA mismatch people without having graft versus host disease. Of these four patients, of these five patients they tested, um, four of them they were able to discontinue immunosuppression on at 240, between 240 days and 422 days out with good renal function. The mechanism is unclear, but because there's no permanent engraftment or permanent chimerism, it's likely thought to be a peripheral mechanism with, um, with T regulatory cells re inducing lasting, um, uh, uh, resist, uh, lasting tolerance. And in, they were able to show that uh, these patients actually have increased levels of FOXP3 mRNA in their urine, which is a classic marker of T regulatory cells. The Stanford protocol, which is one that I think we're interested in here, um, looks at um, generating persistent mixed chimerism. So patients have um, a almost permanent engraftment of both the donor as well as their own immune system in the body, which allows them to have continued central tolerance to the graft. This has to be done in HLA identical patients, otherwise they run the risk of graft versus host disease. And they were able to show in these identical brothers that um, cyclosporin could be discontinued six months uh, with per persistent renal allograft function. Lastly, I'm not going to spend too long on this because this is a very, they used a proprietary method that isn't really available to all of us, but it's based on some, um, this idea that there are certain facilitator cells in the hematopoietic stem cell niche mm -hmm. that aid in engraftment of the donor hematopoietic stem cells, as well as a dendritic subpopulation that induces the production of T regulatory cells, which induce lasting, um, lasting tolerance uh, peripherally. And they showed that using this proprietary uh, hematopoietic stem cell um, cocktail, they were able to get uh, two patients have a transient chimerism and were maintained on low dose immunosuppression, but five patients in this small series, they were able to get a durable chimerism with no graft versus host disease and sustained graft function off immunosuppression. Again, these are all really small trials, a lot of them based on basic science and, um, and uh, are really experimental. So there's no really good evidence for any of these. Miles? Um, it's so far from every from everything I've seen. It's been always living. Um, so now a number of you are probably sitting, and so that's the bulk of what I'm going to present data wise today. Um, a number of you are probably sitting in the crowd, going, "Okay, I'm not a transplant surgeon. Why do I care?" 
Um, I mean, this is like a great intellectual curiosity. Um, and the, the reality is, um, I think that while HLA and transplant may not be applicable to all the urologists out there, every urologist deals with cancer. And I think the days where we can ignore the immune system in cancer are gone, especially with the advent of new immunotherapies. And the field of immuno-oncology is a budding field. And, uh, you know, Simon presented very skillfully last week on the topic of um, immuno-oncology, or the week before, rather. And I think that as this field, as these uh, checkpoint inhibitors gain momentum in the treatment of both kidney and bladder cancer, and maybe select subpopulations of prostate cancer patients, understanding the interplay between HLA variants and the response to um, immunotherapy is going to matter. And this is a very nice study out of Memorial Stone Sloan Kettering, where they typed 1,535 advanced non-small cell lung cancers and melanomas, and they looked at HLA variants and to see how this affected their outcomes when treated with PDL1 inhibitor. Then they went back after treatment and resequenced cancers that recurred. And what they showed was there's specific variants that are associated with better or worse outcomes in response to immunotherapy. But in general, greater diversity at HLA loci actually was a good prognostic indicator in um, checkpoint inhibition. What I think is even more interesting is they show that immuno immunotherapy applies a selection pressure on cancers to induce loss of heterozygosity at HLA loci and restricts the number of antigens that can be presented. And in non-responders, loss of heterozygosity um, was a negative prognostic outcome. You know, and we use all the time you know, BCG as an entry-level immunotherapy in bladder cancer, and some patients who then go on to try to get PDL1 one or go on to get um, checkpoint inhibition. What if we're put, applying a selection pressure with BCG that then might decrease their ability to respond to uh, P, uh, checkpoint inhibition later? So I think that this field of HLA is, is just growing and, and is of extreme interest to a lot of different fields, not just transplant, but also in oncology. So with that, I'd like to conclude with a couple of brief summary remarks. MHC and their HLA gene products are highly variable and highly immunogenic. HLA matching influences outcomes, as we've seen, and, but also presents uh, challenges for finding a donor. Recipient sensitization to HLA presents further challenges to finding a donor, but can be circumvented using antibody depleting techniques. And transplant tolerance is a promising field in which um, we may broaden the availability of transplant and minimize the need for immunosuppression. So um, with that, I'm happy to take any questions.